Kiwi, what's going on, brother man? Oh, hey, Tony, how you doing? Oh, no, living the dream. See, that's yeah. reassuring to me. Because, <laughs> like, you're as much of a slob as I am when you're working on stuff. <laughs> the, only, the only difference between you and me is that my mess looks like that, but it doesn't look like that. Ah, uh, okay. That's, God. All right. Yeah, you can usually tell where I've been working. Oh, it's Mr. Napa. Mr. Napa. Hi, Mr. Napa. Hey, man, how you doing? So, uh, well, the reason I came here was because it happened before, before I, I, we talked about that, 429, every time I come here, mm -hmm. let's get the light good. Okay, yeah, that's better. Every time I come here, I get, I get a lot of criticism. Uh, people tell me, you know, you go to Kiwi's place, you steal his content, and then you can never remember. And you raid the trash can. And, and raid his trash cans. <laughs> And you can never get his name right, the channel name right. Right. Because I, I, you know, I have that short-term memory issue, you know, brain trauma. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna set this straight. Is that where Uncle Kathy spent, beats I, on you? Need a little bit too much. Uncle Kathy and various race cars and stuff like that. Right. Brain trauma. Um, and I think there might have been a lack of oxygen at birth situation too. But um, I, I spent hours last night. After our show, because we do a show now every, every Thursday night, it's a Q and A show. Us um, Thursday, Thursday nights at seven o'clock, standard Central Standard Time. All right. Um, so I spent a good bit of time last night memorizing it. I have it straight, and I'm going to make sure that you get the promotion that you deserve. There you go. Okay. Right. So listen, if you're a human inhabiting this plane of existence you have an obligation to subscribe to this man's channel well, that's, that's, yeah, I, I get that. and then once you've subscribed you need to force or coerce every man woman and child you encounter through the rest of your life's journey to also subscribe to his channel Kiwis. You say the name, brother. Kiwis Classics and Customizers. So close. You nearly had it. Kiwis Classics and cost Customs. Yes. Well done. Okay. So let's uh I wanted to well I've already almost burned down three minutes. People are already clicking away from this video. Like, oh, no. I like I clicked on this because I wanted to see Boss 429 and, and they're just yakking. So the oh, reason I came here is because last time on the show he tells me, oh, I got this giant Kazi 600 cubic inch Boss 429 sitting on the floor of the shop. I said, I'll be there in the morning. So here I am, it's the morning, and there it is. So real quick, what, what is this? That is, like literally as it says, the Boss 600, so 600 cubic inches, made, built by John Cossey. Um, anyone who's even you know remotely into Fords is probably going to have heard of John oh, of Cossey course. he builds builds these motors for race boats race cars street cars street rods all right so uh, it's got it's got EFI stack injection on it yep it has all of this stuff including air conditioning including which in my mind that's just weird okay yeah you know but that's okay that's okay um and what's the price tag on this thing this thing as it sits there Ex excluding shipping is $43,000. Say that again, sorry. <laughs> $43,000. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of shit off. It, that's a lot of money. Uh, it is 868 horsepower, like dyno. You've got the dyno sheet. 868 pump yeah. gas horsepower. Yeah. Right. Okay. 93, but you know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's still steep for the power, but I mean, look, look what you're getting here. This, it's, jewel it's jewelry. It's oh, internal really combustion right. jewelry. If I had that, that kind of money to burn, I'd put I'd put a glass top on it and make it a coffee table. Yeah, no, no <laughs> falling. But I wanted to talk about the Boss 429 in general, okay? Because, like, okay, I'm I am Mopar to the core, right? I I bleed Mopar, but I try to represent all of the different engines and manufacturers fairly because they all have their their, you know, the high points, their low points, they have their, their merits and they have their, their issues. So 
the Boss 429 is, I've always looked at the Boss 429 as an engine that got a raw deal. Because ultimately, this is the engine that should have been the lead performance motor through the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. This actually probably should have been where the big block Chevy is today. The big block Chevy being the undisputed king of naturally aspirated horsepower. So to understand where this engine comes from, you have to look at the history of, of the Hemi and the semi-Hemi and what brought us to where we are today. So you go back to 1951 with Chrysler adopting the, the Hemi, the 331 Hemi, firepower. Now, Chrysler was not looking for crazy top fuel performance. That wasn't even on the radar. It didn't exist. Drag racing didn't exist at the time. All Chrysler wanted was an efficient combustion chamber that would deal with all of the various grades of fuel that people would encounter through the course of their, their travels. The Hemi combustion chamber was less prone to detonation on weak fuel, so you could add a little more ignition time in and have the car be a little more peppy via that hemispheric combustion chamber. And the chamber itself was as simple and crude and brutal as possible. It's essentially the 1906 Peugeot Hemi cylinder head, but just cast in the form of an American V8. All right, so then 1964 comes around, right? And Chrysler looking for an edge, specifically for NASCAR, decides to adapt the hemispheric combustion chamber as found in the earlier motor onto their current, at the time, 426 big block. The only difference they made, aside from larger valves, larger ports, larger valves, was a slightly deeper combustion chamber, which was not a good idea because at that point it took more, a heavier piston with more of a dome to make any real compression. But they made these compromises to make the, the heads fit the block and the package ended up working out nicely. Okay, so Ford, wait, Chevy in the meantime has a regular production their big block. So that was a semi-hemi, right? And it's, it's really, it's the same way, the same essential design that's in use today. But that engine was a natural right out, right out of the box. It did everything well. Chevy didn't really have to play the hemi game at that point. They may have had to if things kept evolving. But what happens now, Ford in 65 says, well, you know what? Chrysler's got the 426 Hemi. We need something to compete with that. So Ford answers the question that nobody ever asked and puts overhead cams on top of a set of Hemi combustion chambers and mounts it on the FE block. Now, the, the 427 camera, there were a couple of, you know, you had a couple of issues with this. For openers, the motor itself, and I spent, an ex I spent a lot of time studying the 427 motor. I was, at one point, I was going to work with somebody on a top fuel car, an Astasha top fuel car, with a blown fuel camera motor. So I studied this thing extensively, every little bit of it. And essentially, the 427 single overhead cam motor is an exact cross between an early Hemi, the 392 style early Hemi, and a 426 Hemi. All of the dimensions, everything is, is like almost an exact split between the two. So, NASCAR right away says, nope, this is going too far, and they can all hemispheric combustion chambers. They don't want any type of any type of oddball things, just production line engines. So the 426 and the camera are, are set to drag racing only. It's the only place where they can be used. Now at that point, the camera had a couple of weak spots. The first was the timing chain. This is on, on, on Nitro. The timing chains would stretch a lot, and so cam timing would vary a lot. It wasn't until 1970 that Pete Robinson actually created a functional gear drive for these engines to do away with that. But the basic problem with using the camera in nitro racing was the weaknesses of the block, the FE block that they, they installed in it. The FE block was never intended, neither was the, 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 the Chrysler, but the FE block was never intended for that kind of abuse. And so the saddles would, would rip out. They had oiling issues, the regular FE, but the cameras were all side oilers, so they did it, they got around that. But like I said, the block had certain shortcomings that didn't allow it to live blown on nitro. So the 426 Hemi was, 
was the path that that, that whole segment of the sport took off on and, and basically stayed with until today, 60 years later, still based on the 426 Honda. All right, so now, later on, you go fast forward a couple of years, 1968, 1969, Ford, they have homologation rules where if you produce 500 versions of an engine for street use, you can use it in NASCAR. So Ford goes about designing the Boss 429. Now, here's the unique thing about the Boss 429. The camber is an exact cross between the early Hemi, the early Chrysler Hemi, and the late Chrysler Hemi. The Boss 429 is an exact cross between the 426 Hemi and the big block Chevy. Right? Okay. So, what they did was, instead of having a big open dome with big valves and all of that, they made a shallower combustion chamber, more like the Chevy, less of a valve angle. Instead of having the valves directly in line with each other, they're canted. That's why, that's why you're, you're, the lump on the valve cover from the intake side is here and here's the exhaust. On a 426 Hemi or a camera, they're directly in line with each other. So you've got a shallower chamber and a slightly cross flow, a slightly twisted cross flow design. Ford calls this the, called it a, a crescent combustion chamber. Now the thing about the crescent combustion chamber is that unlike the early Hemi, the 426 Hemi, and the camera, the Boss 429 has two quench pads. So on either side of the valves, there's two quench pads, very much like a modern, like a contemporary nowadays top of the line normally aspirated race engine. This is where that combustion chamber got its start. It's a thing of beauty. And like I said, it's, it's an exact cross between the Chrysler Hemi and the Chevy Rat Motor. Now, it got a bad, it got off to a bad start. 1969, they put these things in Mustangs. 1969 and 1970, they built like a, how many, how many things they built? Like 1,300? It wasn't a lot. They, they built some money, some money of 1,300 Boss 429 Mustangs and two Cougars. I know about that. Two 1970, 1969 Cougars got Boss 429. But in order to put it in the Mustang body, they strangled it. So this engine could have had enormous street cred right off the bat. If they had just followed the blueprint of, let's say, the 426 Hemi of the day, used sufficient carburetors. The, 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 the Hemi used a pair of six and a quarter AFBs. Uh, it, a, a, an efficient exhaust system, right? They would have had it. But instead, Ford, for whatever reason, Ford does strange things. You know, you got to admit it. Even you diehard Ford guys, you got to admit it. Ford does strange things. They took these Mustangs, they modified the shock towers to get these engines to fit inside of them, but they strangled it with these like log exhaust manifolds. And then they topped the thing off with a 700, and, I think it was 735, smaller than 750 CFM. I think it was a 735 Holly, right? A vacuum secondary Holly. Feeding these giant ports and giant valves. They rated it at 375 horsepower. I mean, right off the bat, the rating should have should have told you there was a problem there, right? Because at the time, the 426 Hemi was rated at 425 horsepower, and it was actually 460, 470 horsepower for a well-tuned engine. These things were rated at 375, but if you put them on a dyno, they'd only make about 350. I've, I've looked into this. I've looked at dyno tests done on these engines from the day, and it's at 350, 360 horsepower. They gave it a soft hydraulic cam. They gave it a California emissions package. Why did they do this? Right? It was the ultimate in stupidity. They gave it like a California emissions package. The distributor and, and, and the, the carburetor were calibrated for emissions. And on top of that, each one of these things got a smog pump. Right? I mean, like literally, they did every single thing they possibly could to hurt this engine. And underneath all of that compromise and, and just stupidity was a jewel of internal combustion it, but it never gained any street cred because the cars they put them in it, it was just an ill-suited car for the application 
big ports, big valves, no carburation, no ignition to support it, no exhaust. It, these things have a, tr a single transverse mounted muffler in the back, right? They were crippled, and because of that, they received no street cred. Nobody was falling all over themselves to buy a Boss 429. Then on top of that, in, in drag racing now, pro stock had just come around. And you say, well, okay, this would be perfect for pro stock, right? No, because back in the day, pro stock was based on, was based on pounds per cubic inch. So these engines didn't work well at smaller sizes. The 426 Hemi did work well at smaller sizes. So there were 404 inch versions, there was a 396 version, there was a 377 version. All of them worked very well in pro stock cars of the day. But you couldn't do that to the Boss 429 because the, port, the, the cylinder heads just would not work with the, the cubic inch reduced like that. These engines didn't, they worked in NASCAR. They, they stuck around in NASCAR until 1974. I could be wrong on that. I think it was 1974. But they didn't have really a home in, in professional racing. Yeah, there were a couple of people running them in Comp Eliminator and, and various gas classes and so on and so forth. But they didn't really find a home in professional drag racing. Wait, I have to go back. I have to go back. So we're talking about the camera and the camera's problems on Nitro all really had to do with the main webbing of the block. It just wasn't up to the task. The thing that made the Boss 429 work so well normally aspirated was those two quench pads. But on nitro, those two quench pads were areas where detonation would set in. Because remember, a nitro motor was incredibly high cylinder pressure, and nitro is, is not only shock sensitive, forget about shock sensitive, uh, nitro is detonation prone, right? And they weren't running big fuel volumes back in the day. So when these engines first came out, people like Mickey Thompson, who had like really unlimited budgets, and, and factory backing, tried to make these engines work. Kind of collider ran them, a bunch of people, a bunch of different people ran them, but not for long because the engines would unscrew themselves from detonation. So they didn't work in, in top fuel funny car. They didn't, they weren't practical to use in pro stock. And so they just kind of like disappeared from the scene. And that was it, right? No, that wasn't it. Because in 1982, the NHRA changed the rules for pro stock. So now instead of it being a weight per cubic inch class, now it was just a 500 cubic inch maximum limit class. And the Boss 429, people started to look at that engine again. It's like, okay, now this thing may work at 500 cubic inches. It's got the port and the valves to make this happen. But in 1985, I could be wrong about this. Maybe it was 86, 85 or 86, the IHRA went to the mountain motor pro stock. So they said, well, if NHRA is going to limit you to 500 cubic inches, go ahead, just run as big a thing as you want. So all of a sudden, people were making 600, 700, 800 cubic inch engines. And at 800 cubic inches, do you know what makes power? The Boss 429. It was perfect. It dominated IHRA mountain motor pro stock, and it worked re really well at the 500 inch NHRA limit. So that's where the engine came, came into its own. It took, it was like 13, 12, 13, 14 years after its creation that it actually found a home where it, could, where it worked, where it could dominate. And that's, that brings us to today. The Boss 429 is the engine that got a raw deal. This would be the one that, this would be the motor that like everybody was after, everybody wanted if, if Ford didn't strangle it with limited production numbers and all of that goofy emission packaging and, and, and bad idea. Ford, you screwed the pooch with that one. It's a jewel. So John Cassie now builds these things from the ground up. This is, it's, a, it's an aluminum copy of, of the, you know, the regular 385 block. And the heads, I don't believe, are much different than the originals. But we're not going to pop the valve covers off of this forty-three thousand dollars motor to no, find out. I don't think the, you know the owner would be too uh, pleased about that. Yeah. Um, I've seen the cylinder heads bare, and the ports are just absolutely gigantic. Oh, I know. Like it's, you could reach down there and, and, and touch the back of the valve head almost, not quite, but you know, uh, massive, massive ports. I know. Uh, which is why they like the more cubic inches, because at a, at a 429 level, they're just, they're not 
pull in enough air through to, yeah. to make everything work, to get, make fuel atomized and all that fun stuff. No velocity. Yeah. No velocity. Yeah. Now, I remember when, uh, when Kazi first started building the, the, the big motors, the, the pro stock motors, they had uh, an Orville Redenbacher uh, popcorn container, you know, yeah, yeah. and they had it in the cylinder to show the size. Oh, yeah. you know I, mean? I give you an idea what the bore was on it. Yeah. Well, this 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 video's already gone on for like twenty minutes here. I I can, guys, I could ramble on about this stuff all day long. I'm trying to condense everything real quick because people start tuning away after just like fifteen minutes. It's like I've had enough of this. Goodbye. Click. So, we'll stop this now. I'm gonna come back in a couple of days. We're gonna do an update on this on this cougar over here. Okay. Dude, it's just that's just look at the work you do. It's beautiful. And that motor is going in. What motor is that going in? It's going. There's a oh, rendering oh, oh. on the wall over here. Sure about to pick it up from there. But it's a '64 Fairlane. Okay. Uh, it's a two-door hardtop car. We've already chopped the roof two and a half inches. Done done a lot of sheet metal work on that car, uh, and that's just in storage at the moment, basically waiting in the queue behind this one. Um, it's the same same gentleman that owns them, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, but yeah, he's had that motor, like John Cossey's. Like, they're obviously popular because that took about eight months to get that engine. Eight months? Yeah. And and it's 50% up front. It's not just like a thousand dollar holding deposit. You've got to pay 50% of the final price up front. Uh, um, and if you don't like that, he's like, okay. Right, I mean, if you're going to play at that level, you've got to be yeah. ready to play at that level. Yeah. But you know, he's got a lot of outlay too, like just the block alone is probably seven, eight thousand know, dollars. Yeah. So you start, you, you, you take the first part of the engine and start building it, you know, like a, a builder's already in deep. So, so you know, that 50% deposit's really not unreasonable. Wait, I can't finish this video yet. I gotta go back to this. <laughs> I gotta go back over here because you just reminded me of something. So, all right, just quick Boss 429 trivia, all right? So let's just say, you have one of these original motors, one of the original 500 or so that found their way into streetcars. 500, 1500 or so, that found their way into streetcars. Let's just say you want to do head gaskets on it. You're going to pull the thing apart and you want to change the head gaskets. Guess what you're going to pay for a pair of head gaskets for one of these engines? No, no idea. No idea? No. Between two and three thousand dollars for the head gaskets for a Boss 429. The reason being is that, remember this was a NASCAR engine, so it was designed to live all day at 7,500 7, RPM. That's what it was designed for, that's what it was built to do. Now at that level, these engines developed some seepage between the block and the head. And so the head gaskets on these things were made mostly out of O-rings. Like there was a regular, there was a, like a normal, head gasket that would fit in there and then in addition to the normal head gasket were o-rings so every passage between the block and the head had a separate o-ring and today those gasket sets they price between 2,000 2,500 I, I saw one on eBay at one point for like $2,900 that's now the sense it's been revised since then Right, the engines that were built since that, since that period of time, but the ones that were were that ended up in streetcars, were actually race engines that they detuned with the camshaft and the carburetor and blah 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 blah. But they kept the same design head gasket, so you had a an exotic NASCAR head gasket system that ended up on the streetcars. Wow. Yeah. Um, cool. Trivia, Boss Four Twenty Nine trivia. Hmm. All right. A kiwi. Oh, I gotta yep. turn this around this way. There we are. There we go. Okay, there we are. Okay. I still think we make an awesome couple, right? And uh, I, I don't mean that in that way. Well, yeah. So you want to tell people when we're going to be on live? Oh, we're going to do lives on Thursday nights, uh, 7 p.m. Central. And uh, yeah, jump on board and ask whatever questions you want, and, and the, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. And they'll all be answered with a funny accent, either his from where he comes from or mine, the whole New York accent. I, I got a pleasant, mine's a pleasant accent. Mine isn't. 
my, 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 it's just, it's just, a, just an ugly accent. But either way, you know, you, you get technical answers with, a, with an accent. How do you beat that? No other channel on YouTube offers yeah, that. Yeah. Or the humor, the, the level of sophisticated humor that we have. I'm not trying to be funny. <laughs> and yet people laugh at you. <laughs> and it hurts me. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you guys. Look at this, look at this mess. Hey, I'm being creative.